we're here today uh, to learn about seniors and uh, all of the issues surrounding uh, dissolution of marriages and injunctions and the issues that they face in those in those subjects. Uh, with us today, we have three uh, speakers. We have um, first up, and not in any particular order. I'm just you know giving the names. Uh, we have uh, Serena Pines, who is a manager of the Family Law Unit at Community Legal Services of Mid Florida. Then we also have Audia Burgos Morgan, who is a staff attorney in the Family Law Unit at Community Legal Services of Mid Florida. And last but certainly not least, we have Sylvia Lopez, who is also uh, a staff attorney in the Family Law Unit of uh, the Community Legal Services of Mid Florida. So we have three experts who are in the trenches every single day uh, on these topics. And uh, we thank you three very much for being here uh, and sharing your time and your knowledge with us. So without further, I will turn it over to you. Hi, good afternoon, I'm Serena Pines. And today um, we're going to talk about uh, divorce as it pertains to seniors. We're gonna talk about various aspects of family law and we have prepared a hypo to guide our discussion and part of the presentation, uh, we're going to operate as a panel and discuss that hypo after we've discussed the law. So we work for community legal service in the family law unit and just to let you know some of the things that we do. Um, in addition to family law and domestic violence work, the firm handles housing issues, fair housing, public benefits, children's issues related to education, consumer debt issues, and uh, much, much more. So with that, I'm going to start by discussing some of the things that are that fall under the umbrella of the family law court. So that is where the divorce called dissolution of marriage uh, is found is under family law in chapter 61. We're going to touch on equitable distribution, which is the division of marital assets and debts. We're going to talk about alimony, time sharing that was referred to as custody when I was a kid, parental responsibility, child support. Um, in family law, there's also the establishment of paternity, so dealing with time sharing uh, when individuals are married, and there are domestic violence injunctions and other types of injunctions. So our hypo, Marcy and Ed, and we're going to be talking about Marcy and Ed uh, throughout the presentation. So Marcy lived in Maryland with her husband, husband Edward Jones. Edward developed Parkinson's and became violent towards her. He never acted in this manner during their 30-year marriage. Marcy developed lupus and became fearful of living with Ed. She regularly felt ill and worried that Ed might hurt her during one of his less lucid moments. She certainly couldn't properly rest while he was acting out. She decided to move to Florida to stay with her lifelong friend, Agnes. She decided that once she arrived in Florida and was settled, she would file for divorce. She thinks it'll take her about a month to get settled. So in, in light of her concern about living with Ed, it brings us into discussion of domestic violence injunctions, because that may be the sort of thing that, that she ultimately may want to file. A domestic violence injunction is a type of injunction, a type of case that a person can file to get an order that prevents an abuser from um, having contact with them. For a domestic violence injunction, the parties have to have a family relationship of some sort. And through a domestic violence injunction, in addition to ordering that the abuser has no contact with the petitioner um, or the what we call the survivor of domestic violence, the court can also award temporary exclusive use of uh, use of possession of a marital home, the court can award sole custody of a child, the court can award alimony on a temporary basis, temporary child support. The court, uh, through the injunction, will enter um, an order that 
prohibits the respondent from having a gun can order the respondent into treatment of some sort, a mental health evaluation, following up on treatment with that, batter's intervention, substance abuse uh, evaluation. A person can file the injunction if it appears that there's uh, imminent risk of violence, the court may set a temporary injunction in place and then there'll be a hearing. And at the final hearing, the court will determine whether or not to extend that temporary injunction. The injunctions need to be proved with substantial competent evidence. So that's a lower standard than the criminal standard of beyond a reasonable doubt. So again, on this slide here, we're talking about the types of relief that can be ordered. So the um, possession, substance use and possession of the home, and the time sharing support. Um, something that was added to the statute recently um, within the last couple of years is the exclusive care of possession or control of an animal, because that often becomes an issue for individuals trying to flee from violence because as they're concerned that their animal may be uh, harmed by the abuser, um, or just that there may be, become an issue of who gets to have the animal. And there is a catch-all in the statute that the court can order other relief as deemed just and proper. So uh, things I've seen may include issues related to a vehicle, that sort of thing. Other types of injunctions that exist uh, in Florida. So we have, um, a sexual violence injunction, so if a person's been a victim of um, sexual battery, if uh, the court enters an injunction there, there'll be uh, no contact between the abuser and the victim. The individual that's filing the injunction does have to cooperate with law enforcement, um, and the ultimate order will also require the respondent to not have any weapons. There's something called a dating violence injunction in Florida. So that's for people who haven't lived together, don't have children together, but they've had a romantic relationship within the last six months. So again, an in, in injunction orders no contact from the respondent to the petitioner. So the, the court will enter an order if the petitioner shows they've been a victim of, of dating violence and have reason to believe that violence is going to continue. There's also something called a repeat violence injunction in Florida, and that's for people who don't have a family relationship, they haven't dated. Oftentimes, um, I've seen this filed by individuals who are neighbors, you know, neighbor dispute, or uh, perhaps a uh, current romantic partner of uh, some individual and their uh, other romantic, their prior romantic partner, and then maybe the prior romantic partner is not taking it well. So for that type of an injunction, the responding party, the perpetrator has to have committed two acts of violence against the person seeking the injunction. Uh, the legislature also created a injunction specifically for stalking, and that's something that didn't exist uh, that, to my knowledge, as I recall, about 15 years ago. So basically, to permit stalking. And stalking is when somebody's being harassed. Um, so a person's doing something to them that has no legitimate purpose and causes them substantial emotional distress, um, or whether being followed or cyber stalked. And with all of these injunctions, it will prohibit contact from the respondent uh, to the requesting party. There is also another type of injunction uh, that's relatively new in the grand scheme of injunctions is an injunction that was created to prevent exploitation of a vulnerable adult. And so what the court will do there is basically um, order that if, if the case is proved, then the court can enter an order that pro prohibits the exploiter from having contact with the person seeking the injunction. It can freeze the um, accounts of the vulnerable adult. So this is going to be a scenario maybe where a, a caretaker is improperly using uh, the petitioner's funds, um, you know, advancing large sums of money, using credit lines. 
the injunction, if it's entered, can also um, give the person seeking the injunction, you know, exclusive use of the home and, and keep the exploiter out of the home. Uh, also, you know, take away the exploiter's use, perhaps, of a vehicle owned by the petitioning person. Slide. Okay, so hi everyone. My name is Sylvia Lopez, and I'm going to talk to you about jurisdiction issues. Um, it's not always the most exciting topic when it comes to these kind of cases, but it's definitely one of the more important ones. You have to have jurisdiction regardless of what kind of case you file. So I'm going to go over three terms specifically, and then apply them to domestic violence injunctions, the hypo that Serena read off earlier, and to um, how it applies to the hypo as far as the solution of marriage. So the first term that we're going to discuss is subject matter jurisdiction. So in Florida, you have to have at least one of the two parties um, prove residency here in the state of Florida for the last six months before they file the petition for dissolution of marriage. That's very important. Um, and you can prove that either by filing a copy of your ID, your Florida ID, your state ID, or filing an affidavit of cooperating witness where the person has under notary, um, under oath, gone ahead and signed off that yes, they know you for the last six months, they've seen that you've lived here in the state. Um, the other term is personal jurisdiction, and this is one of the ones that's a little bit more confusing. So even though any state can essentially grant you a divorce, can go ahead and deem you single, if there are other issues to the marriage that need to be addressed, for example, the division of property, if there's children involved, if there is alimony that needs to be granted or, or not, or just addressed, then we're going to have a problem because we need to have personal jurisdiction over the respondent. So the way that that happens is you have to be able to prove a connection between the state of Florida and the person that you're filing the case against, in this case, your, your spouse. So um, one of the ways to do that if they don't live in the state of Florida is through Florida's long arm statute. And it's a pretty long statute, I didn't include it in the slide, but essentially this statute allows you to create established minimum contacts between the respondent and between the state of Florida. A couple of examples of what would do that is, um, for example, if they have a business in the state of Florida, if they've ever been sued in the state of Florida, um, let's say that you're trying to open up a paternity case and the child was born in the state of Florida. One of the more simple things is if your spouse happens to be visiting you while they're while you're here living in the state of Florida, you can have them served while they're here, and that way the court has jurisdiction over them. So that's very important. Um, and then the third term is venue. So you also have to be able to file your case in the correct venue. And so what makes it the correct venue? It has to be the last place where the parties, the spouses, live together with a common intent to remain married. Um, if that wasn't within, well, the other, the other option of that is where the respondent lives. So just in case it's not clear, the petitioner is a person that follows a petition. Um, in our high school, for example, that would be Marcy, and the respondent would be Edward, the one that's receiving your petition. So. Let's go back to um, our hypo, for example, and we're going to talk about how jurisdiction applies in this scenario. So, for example, um, there's two issues here that need to be addressed. Marcy is probably going to be interested in filing some sort of injunction for the fears that she has over Edward, and she also wants to file a divorce. So, as far as the injunction goes, injunctions are a little different from the solution of marriages. You do not need to have a residency requirement. So Marcy does not have to worry about the fact that when she gets to Florida, she hasn't been here for six months. The problem still is that you're going to run into an issue when it comes to personal jurisdiction. We don't receive any information here that Edward has any ties to the state of Florida. So unless Edward is going to come visit Marcy at some point or just be in the state of Florida, period, she's going to have a hard time serving him. So she's going to have a hard time with jurisdiction. Um, when it comes to that, I would recommend if I was having a consultation with Marcy that before she moves, um, she get in touch with an attorney in Maryland to see if it would be best for her to file an injunction while she's still in the state of Maryland. And it's important for her to know that even if later on, let's say she gets granted that injunction in the state of Maryland, 
If she then moves to Florida, it's enforceable in the state of Florida as well. So hopefully that takes care of her concerns there. When it comes to the divorce, we run into several problems with her filing in Florida. One, she will not have lived in Florida long enough by the time she gets down here. So again, she needs to be here for six months. Um, we run into issues with personal jurisdiction if she wants to file in the state of Florida. We don't have any information as to whether Edward has any ties to the state of Florida. So again, we would be stuck with probably, she's gonna have to prove that there is some sort of tie here. Um, if there are issues regarding property division or if there are issues with her wanting alimony from Edward. Um, and again, one of the ways for her to get around that is if Edward ends up coming to visit Florida, she can get him served while she's down here. And then that takes care of that issue. We still, however, run into a problem with venue. Um, there is no county in Florida where the parties live together with the common intent to remain married. And the respondent, Edward, does not live in the state of Florida. So again, I would have to recommend that she get in touch with an attorney in Maryland as it doesn't look like Florida is gonna be the uh, state where she can file for a divorce. So, Going back to the um, the hypo as it relates to the injunction, so for Marcy, she could file a variety of injunctions really given her circumstance. She could file the domestic violence injunction because the parties were married. Um, and so assuming that she has reasonable fear of her husband, she might be able to get an injunction or and the hypo says that he's been violent towards her. If he's committed certain types of violence, uh, then she may be able to get the other types of injunctions that I mentioned. Perhaps uh, Ed is contacting her from Maryland, sending her lots of messages that are distressing to her, calling her at all hours of the night and hanging up. Maybe she can get a stalking injunction um, or potentially a repeat violence injunction, but, but she'd probably be less likely to use that mechanism. An issue, again, is going to be personal jurisdiction over Ed. Uh, he could consent to the court's jurisdiction if he's been served and he just makes an appearance, and that would uh, pertain both to a divorce as well as to an injunction. So I think that's it for injunctions in this hypo. Mm -hmm. So I think now we're going to have Aria talk to us about division of marital property and debt. I did just want to mention one more thing that I forgot to say. Let's say, for example, that we're consulting with Edward, um, and it was Edward living here in Florida, and there is a jurisdiction. Let's say Marcy wanted to file an injunction in Maryland, so the hypo is the opposite way around. Um, if there is a problem with personal jurisdiction, Edward is going to have to bring it to the court's attention the very second he's in front of the court. So otherwise, if he does not, then it's going to be something he waived. So just make sure that you um, take note of that as well. All right, so good afternoon. My name is Aurea Pugos Moragon, and I'm going to talk to you about equitable distribution, which is one of those areas that are resolved within the dissolution of marriage. Uh, and also one of the areas of big contention, especially if there's a lot of assets and liabilities. So um, with equitable distribution, um, the court starts with the premise that there's a presumption that anything that is acquired during the marriage is presumed to be marital property. And that goes for assets and liabilities. And it does not matter um, if one, one item, you know, one asset or a liability is only, is only titled under one person. As long as it was acquired during the marriage, that's going to be presumed to be marital property. But what is during the marriage? Well, the marriage is gonna be characterized as the moment you marry, all the way to the date of separation if the parties agree that there's a date of separation, or if there's no agreement on that, it's gonna be the date of filing of the petition for the solution of marriage. So one of those two. And it's important to establish that time frame because that's what you're looking at as far as what was acquired. When we're talking about assets, we're talking about things as marital, like the marital home, it could be stocks, it could be, it could be bonds, it could be personal property, you know, it could be um, IRAs for uh, one case. There's a whole list of things that can be considered marital assets so long as they're acquired in a marriage, they're going to be presumed to be marital. 
Uh, for liabilities, we're talking about things like credit card bills, student loans, personal loans. Um, uh, maybe, you know, there's a, a oh, uh, for, you know, maybe uh, car loans. There's a host of other things that can go into that pool of what we consider marital, marital liabilities. And I want to make clear that uh, I keep stressing the word presumption. The reason it's a presumption is because with every presumption, you can actually rebut it if you have competent substantial evidence to prove it. Uh, if, like everything in the law, it's not necessarily what you know, it's also what you're able to prove. So it's very important that when you're accessing what, are, what is marital, that you know when the item was acquired, what the value of that um, asset or liability, that asset is, or if it's a liability, how much is owed of that liability. Now, when we talk about value, I want to be very clear. We're talking about fair market value, okay? So what is the fair market value of that item if you were to sell it today? And so that's, those are things that need to be considered. There are scenarios where the parties have separate property. Separate property would be considered anything acquired prior to the marriage or after the date of separation or date of filing of the petition. And it's presumed that those items acquired before or after the separate, before the marriage or after the separation would be separate property, non-marital, and not subject to equitable distribution. However, there are situations and there are situations. If you have a separate property, it's very possible to convert that separate property into marital property if you commingle. How do you commingle? Well, let's say uh, you have um, Marcy. Let's talk, about, let's talk about Marcy. Marcy had a car prior to the marriage. Then she marries Ed, and then during the marriage, she decides to sell the car. Well, if Marcy takes the monies acquired through that sale and she places them in a separate account that she has that, that Edward never had any access to, that she has effectively maintained the separate nature of that property and it will continue to be separate property and not part of the equitable distribution. However, if Marcy instead takes out those money and puts it in a joint account where Edward has access, now she has effectively commingled the funds and the court is, is gonna acknowledge that this is now marital property that needs to be divided. So what you do with those assets is very important. How you deal with them, how you protect them, that's very important. Um, there are things that uh, kind of fall out are exceptions to the equitable decision, for example, inheritance. Inheritance money and gifts from other family members, if they were solely given to a, one particular spouse, then those things are also separate property. Um, however, gifts between spouses, that's actually part of the equitable distribution. So that's something that you also need to keep in mind. It doesn't matter if the party, let's say, you know, Marcy received that inheritance and she puts it in, a, in an account that maybe. I mean, obviously, Ed is going to try to, you know, get full money from a joint account, but essentially, she, she, that, that inheritance will be protected by the mere fact that it's her inheritance. Now, let's talk about the marital home because that's usually the biggest asset within um, the marriage. So when we're talking about marital, uh, the, the marital home, um, I always try to encourage my clients to sell it out. For many reasons, I mean, it makes everything more clear cut. And if parties go their way, they receive what is owed to them as far as equity, and, and then be done with that. However, sometimes there's parties that have an interest in keeping the property. For example, they want to keep it maybe because you know that's they, they just want to keep it, or maybe because they have children. Um, the key here is if you intend to keep this property. How are you going to pay off the other spouse? In other words, you're going to have to buy out this other spouse. And then the question becomes, can you buy out? Because you can have all the best intentions in the world, but if you don't have the ability to refinance or be able to do whatever it takes to be able to give the other spouse their fair share, you're going to run into, you know, you're still out of luck if the court can see that you cannot pay that property or refinance, the house will be sold. Okay, uh, there are some exceptions with keeping the marital property until children reach the age of 18, the age of majority. Uh, there is case law that support, and also the statute. Sometimes there is an, there's an, an interest 
for the uh, a particular spouse, especially if they have the majority of the time sharing, to keep the marital home for the benefit of the children until the oldest reaches the age of majority. And at that point, it can be decided to be, to be sold and then you know everybody goes their merry way. Um, it's, so, so those are things that, you know, the, those, are, those are really the only two options as far as like what you should do. Um, do sometimes parties decide to keep the property in their name, even after the most yeah, they do that, but highly not recommended. So um, yeah, it's, it's a problem for sure. Um, it's always better to just be, you know, be real, uh, make a decision over the property, whatever that may be, whether it's a buyout or just selling the property altogether. Um, the other aspect of uh, equitable distribution that, uh, that tends to be an, um, an issue, especially with people that are already uh, retiring, uh, it's, it's actually retirement funds, uh, pension plans, 401ks, um, things like that. If they were acquired during the marriage, they are part of the equitable distribution. And so if they were wholly acquired during the marriage, then the, 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 the pension will be divided uh, between the spouses. Now, there are situations where one spouse has, let's say a 401k for you know, simplicity's sake, 401k, they marry, and then of course, five years later, they divorce. Well, in those particular cases, the party that has the 401k is entitled to the value up to the date of marriage. Anything before that, anything before the date of marriage, the party that owns the 401k would have the full value of that. However, any value acquired from the moment you marry all the way to the date of separation or date of filing, that is marital property or presumed to be marital property. So to give you an example, let's say Marcy uh, had $10,000 in a 401k account. She marries Ed, and then five years later, she divorces. And the value required in those five years is $5,000. Well, those $5,000, the first $10,000 would actually belong to Marcy Fair Square because it was prior to the marriage. But anything acquired in between those five years, those $5,000 would be considered marital property. So Ed technically would get $2,500 and Marcy would get $2,500. That's it's very important that you understand that, that family law, family court actually, Public law court is a court of equities. So they're going to try to take all the circumstances and all the actions of the parties in order to try to find some degree of justice. So if you have a spouse that is, is dissipating assets or incurring to more liability, and that's going to affect perhaps that person's share of the assets and liabilities. Of course, again, you have to prove your case with through competent substantial evidence. Um, so um, basically, with one more last thing about four one uh, pension plans and things like that, when there are assets of that nature, you need a qualified domestic relations order in order for the servicer of the uh, of the plan to make the division of those funds. Without that qualified, in its quadros for short, without that qualified domestic relations order the servicer is not going to be able to divide those funds and give the correspond to each the, what's corresponding to each party. So now that being said, we're gonna go into our next um, hypo. So the first hypo that we have for Avia is Marcy expects Ed to pay her half of his veteran's disability, half of his pension, and to set her $1,000 a month so she can eventually move out of Agnes's home, get a new car, and pay for a supplemental Medicare policy. She wants the marital home sold and to receive the proceeds. She also really needs to go to the dentist. All right, so there, there is a component of this hypo that is more related to alimony, which we'll be discussing uh, next. So I'm gonna kind of leave that, and that's actually more about the 1,000 a month that she's asking. Um, as far as the equitable distribution, with the veterans' disabilities, veterans' disabilities are not part of that equitable distribution. However, his pension would be part of that equitable distribution. So um, that's something that she can, you know, allege and, and try to get at least half of that pension. Well, well, well Ari, but could she 
through equitable distributions, they get a chunk of money, maybe she needs some dental implants. Could she ask for equitable distribution? Maybe they have like 15,000 set aside for a full amount of dental implants. No, no, she can't. Not through equitable distribution at all. I mean, equitable distribution strictly deals with what has been acquired during the marriage and essentially divide that. Um, alimony, she can't request, she, she can't specifically request that she be given a certain amount to the dentist. If she gets out of money, then by all means, go to the dentist, but you know, use your money. But you can't just ask for this type of, um, you cannot make this type of request, in other words. So with that global distribution, then we're just dividing up what we have as a couple, as a husband and wife. They would, whatever is left that's marital, whether it's a debt or an asset, that's what's going to be viewed based on the fair market value, and it's going to be divided up. So you mentioned like with the 401k, the marital component, that maybe each person would get $2,500. Is the court just gonna definitively chop stuff in half? So it, it, so this is in theory, the court is gonna try to find, like I just mentioned, it's gonna find equity. And considering that, for example, debts, you can't just simply have a debt and, and allocate debt to people without actually having some mechanism to be able to enforce that. And that's because here in the United States, nobody goes to jail for non-payment of debts unless you are owing the IRS or child support, which you can never escape that. Um, so um, as far as uh, the division of property is concerned, sometimes one party may get more or less of certain assets and liabilities and try to make find equity, but it may not, it's not necessarily gonna take everything and divide it equally and then give you a certain a specific allegation because in reality, some of those things are not enforceable if, if they're made that way. Well, and so also couldn't say an individual keep an entire item, but then the other spouse receive an item of equal mm -hmm. value. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it's still an equal distribution exactly. yet a person got the entirety of one particular item. Yes, so that, that's, that's exactly, exactly how it's going to happen. Uh, the, the court is going to try and look at everything. And then and then if there's an asset that maybe it balances out, there's other liability or whatever, that's exactly how the court is going to kind of look at it. it, it it's kind of hard to explain um, um, it, without actually well, without this, a physical example. This next hypo actually goes into a little bit of that. So when let's you're basically go to the back and forth. So Marcy has always kept up her appearance, which put a financial strain on the marital finances. She looks great, but they spent most of their savings over the years on her amazing wardrobe, skincare, and cosmetic procedures. They still owe on her necklace. Marcy bred Persian cats eight years ago, and she just couldn't part with Fluffy and Puppy, so she didn't sell them. They have a modest home in Maryland, a 10-year-old Mercedes, and, and Ed's 2019 Ford F-150. Their furniture is dated and the interior of the home is styled with a two decade old decor. What would you tell Marcy? So um, if the expectation of Marcy is to have Ed essentially take care of her as far as keeping up your appearance, well, that's obviously not gonna happen. However, the relevant portion of this hypo that, that, that needs to be brought up is that the neck lift is still owing. And if the neck lift was done during the marriage, then whether Ed likes it or not, and he argue, but that's not my neck lift and I don't have to pay this, he would very likely be responsible for half of that debt. So it's, it's, it's the, the, the court is not gonna fix every mistake you ever made, they're just simply gonna try to make it with you. So you're telling me that Ed has to pay for her neck lift? Doesn't have to pay for the neck lift, it has, he has to pay for, for whatever's over the neck lift if it was done during the marriage. Well, or, or, in the equitable distribution scheme, she has the debt on the net lift. True. Maybe he takes the the debt on his fishing lure connection. Yes. Collection. That's 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 more than likely how it's gonna play out. So if if if, my, if the debt of the net lift exists and there's a debt for the fishing gear, and they're kind of both of them balance out, well then the court is gonna say, okay, you keep the net lift debt and you keep the fishing gear in the Debt because they're about substantially the same. That's really, that's in reality how it's going to play out. But in general, those two debts belong to both of them. I have a question. So, what about their two decade old decor? How does 
what do you usually see happen with items in the home? Do people come in and itemize everything down to, you know, the towels in the closet? <laughs> Well, people, people, they itemize a lot of things. <laughs> they, they itemize a lot of things. So, but, but I, I think some, you know, I, I would argue that there's some things that, that should be itemized within reason. So if something is super old, I mean, realistically speaking, is it something that should be included in the distribution? Um, a lot of times what ends up happening with their personal property specifically, People can't get to some agreement as to who's going to keep what, but there's some cases that people will fight because of that. So I mean, it really depends on what's happening, you know, with with the parties. And I mean, but, but yeah, we, uh, everything within reason. And of course, going we go back to what's the fair market value? Does it really have that much value at the end of the day? Unless it's considered an antique. Yeah, and going back to that fair market value, so I don't want to interrupt no, the subject, but um, I did want to bring up the Persian cats. So you mentioned that um, what matters here is fair market value. Cats, it's been decided by case law that it is considered personal property. So unfortunately, there's no such thing as um, the judge is not going to decide time sharing or, you know, the husband's going to get the cats every Monday to Thursday and then the wife gets them the rest of the time. Unfortunately, there's that's going to be separated just like you would the two decade old decor. So what you would you would do is figure out what is the fair market value of those cats. And if Marcy wants to keep those cats and those cats were acquired during the marriage, that's marital property. Therefore, she's going to have to give Ed half of what those cats are worth today in the fair market. Mm -hmm. So that's that's just so you know um, how animals would well, be. And so to, and to explain fair market, fair market isn't what you would buy the item for brand mm -hmm. new. It's not what you bought it for when you acquired it. It's not trading value. It's a value that you took your personal item and put a for sale sign on it. What would you actually get for the item? So sometimes people say it's garage sale value. Craigslist value, Kelly Blue Book, mm -hmm. that's what I like. Yeah. Um, yeah, so as far as everything else, really quick, uh, the modest home in Maryland, 10 year old Mercedes S2019 to 450. If they were acquired in the marriage, yes, that would be, that would go within the pool of assets and liabilities and it would allocate depending on the value, same ways as the cats, same ways as the neck lift, same ways as the fishing gear. So um, that's basically how. Uh, that will work out. Um, so that's it for equitable distribution. Now, Sylvia is going to talk about alimony. Okay, so when it comes to alimony, we have our own hypo. I know it was briefly mentioned before, but we're going to go into a little bit more detail after explaining what alimony is. So, alimony is meant to protect the spouse that is most financially vulnerable after divorce. What is important for all of our clients to know when we talk to them is that alimony in no way is a guarantee. You know, there's no magic number um, to where if you're married for this long, you're absolutely going to be getting alimony. There's just many factors that go into it. One of the most important factors that a person that's asking for alimony has to prove, as in that person has the burden to prove this, is that they have an actual financial need for alimony or maintenance, financial maintenance, and that the other spouse has the ability to pay. So that's not... Um, Obviously, a lot of factors go into that. The other thing that we're going to talk about before we get into the several different types of alimony that the court can consider if they are going to grant alimony is that it does matter how long you've been married. Not because, again, there's a magic number, but because depending on the number of years, you might be uh, considered for essentially either one of the earlier mentioned short term types of alimony or the further down types of alimony, such as permanent alimony. So um, as far as numbers go, a short-term marriage is anything less than seven in the state of Florida. Moderate marriage is anywhere from seven to 17 years, and a long-term marriage is 17 years and beyond. So again, this doesn't mean that a permanent alimony is only um, possible under a long-term marriage, but it is more likely that you get permanent alimony because you're in a long-term marriage, um, along with all the other factors that need to be considered. So let's talk about what these kinds of alimonies mean. So the first one that's mentioned is temporary alimony. Um, unfortunately, and things have only gotten worse recently because of COVID, there's obviously a huge delay. Um, it's not a fast process divorce. 
Sometimes it can take months, a year, sometimes even more than that. And um, if there is a need for financial assistance during that time before you've gotten divorced, that is when you would ask for something called temporary alimony. Um, obviously, it only exists during the divorce proceedings, which means that as soon as your divorce is granted, temporary alimony stops. Um, in addition to that, you can ask for temporary alimony and any of the other ones that are listed. So we'll go through the other ones now. The second one is bridge the gap alimony. This kind of alimony, um, when requested, is specifically made to address legitimate, identifiable short-term needs. So, for example, um, you know, you, you live together with your spouse, and now you're going to have to move live separately. So, any expenses that go into moving out, um, anything as far as setting up your separate utilities, any furniture, you know, your bed, things like that, that can be addressed through bridge the gap alimony. It cannot last more than two years, that kind of alimony, if awarded. Then we have rehabilitative alimony. This kind of alimony, if awarded, requires a specific and defined rehabilitative plan by the person that's requesting it. So usually this kind of alimony is um, for, let's say for example, if I were getting divorced and I wanna go back to school to be able to gain the knowledge to have a different kind of career, right? Or to advance in the career that I already have. In that case, before I am granted rehabilitative alimony, I would have to prove to the court that here is my plan within the next couple of years, let's say two years, I plan to be enrolled in college and about to graduate. Within the next three years, I will have graduated with my master, something like that. Um, if that is granted and if you get alimony, that kind of alimony, and the, the spouse that's getting the alimony deviates away from that plan, that plan, the spouse that's paying for it, it has the ability to go back to court and ask for a modification or for it to be dismissed altogether. Um, next is durational alimony. That is only for a set period of time and it cannot exceed the length of the marriage. So what that means again, just to break it down, if you've been married for three years and you get granted durational alimony, it's not gonna be for anything more than three years. And lastly, permanent alimony. Um, some of you might know that this has been a hot topic lately in the news. Permanent alimony is meant for situations where the former spouse is incapable of taking care of themselves. Um, for example, if they have a permanent disability. This is more common after a long marriage, but again, it's not impossible for it to be um, considered in a short-term or a moderate-term marriage. Now, even though it's called permanent alimony, it's not actually permanent. It lasts until the person that is getting it remarries, um, until uh, if they die, of course, um, or if they're in a financially supportive relationship. If any of those three things happen, then the person that's paying the alimony can go back to court and can uh, request either a, a modification or for it to get dismissed entirely. Um, if you do get awarded alimony, how much is it that you can expect? What the court does look into is what kind of standard of living were you enjoying during the marriage? So for example, if, uh, if I was living within my means during the marriage, that's the exact same level of, of, of life that I can expect as far as what alimony is gonna get me after the marriage. Um, then we have also, the, if there is alimony order, it's important that the spouse that is paying, that is gonna be paying for the alimony knows that they're gonna have to also get life insurance. And of course, um, going back to the topic that we're all here for, an elderly, couples trying to get a divorce, life insurance is a lot more costly at that stage of life. So that's something you need to consider. Um, a lot of times too, the court wants to know whether the person that is asking for alimony made some sort of sacrifice. So for example, um, did that spouse, were they the one that stayed behind and took care of the children? Did they raise the children? Did they take care of the home while the other spouse was advancing in their career? That's something that the court might see as a sacrifice on their end to where, um, you know, they were, the opposite spouse were able to make certain gains in their career that spouse that stayed home with the children was not able to make. That kind of thing is also considered. So now we go to hyper number four and should relate to uh, alimony. Um, Marge's contribution to the 30 year marriage was homemaking, child rearing, and occasional part time job. For those extras that Ed's income could be, could be easily provide. 
Ed is a disabled veteran with a small pension from the Lego factory where he worked when he retired from the Navy. Ed's total monthly income is $3,500 a month. So what issues do you see here as it relates to Marcy uh, receiving outline? So I'm gonna analyze this from both ends. Um, as to Marcy, it's a 30 year marriage, right? So you have a couple, we're gonna go through each factor. Um, 30 year marriage over 17. So it's gonna be a long-term marriage. So she has that working for her. She was um, a homemaker, a child rearing, an occasional part-time job for those extras that Ed couldn't easily provide. So essentially she could argue that she has made sacrifices in her career to be able to do things such as take care of the children and be a homemaker. Um, at the same time, it does say that she had a part-time job at one point, so she does at least have some level of ability to provide for herself, even if just do a part-time job or whatever um, it was that she was doing. As far as Ed's position, though, on this, what's really going to convince the court um, to not award alimony here is the fact that Ed's income is so limited. If he's making $3,500 a month, he doesn't have the ability to pay. So again, Marcy's the one here that's requesting alimony. It's on her, it's her burden to show that she has a financial need and that Ed has the ability to pay. I think given the amount that Ed is making a month, um, the fact that he's a disabled veteran, clearly I, I don't think that the court here would be granting something as uh, alimony. Now it is possible that they might consider one of the more short-term uh, alimonies such as um, bridge the gap or even just temporary alimony. But even then you run into the bigger obstacle of Again, it's on Marcy to prove that he has the ability to pay her any kind of value. Okay, so we did want to briefly talk about minor children. Um, so I, I'm not going to spend too much time here on this subject, but um, there's a couple of terms that we need to discuss when it comes to, to minor children if they are part of the, uh, of the marriage. So again, this applies to not only your biological minor children, but if you have adopted children as part of this marriage, um, those are your legal children as well. So those minor children need to be addressed in this divorce. So the first term is parental responsibility. Parental responsibility is the ability to make decisions on behalf of your children, right, because of your minors. So what the court needs to do is assign what kind of parental responsibility is appropriate for this situation. Each Marriage is different, obviously. So um, if there is not a consensus between the parents as to what they want to do as far as parental responsibility, the court has a couple of options. The first one is sole parental responsibility. In that scenario, um, for example, if let's say Marcy and Ed had children, if um, Marcy wanted to have sole parental responsibility of their kids, she would essentially be asking that she be allowed to make all the decisions on behalf of the kids without having to consult Ed at all. Um, technically, she doesn't even have to keep him informed if that's what the court would agree to, sole parental responsibility. If she asks for that, she has to be able to prove that anything other than sole parental responsibility would be a detriment to the child. So um, again, she has the burden there. Sole parental responsibility is a kind of responsibility that is it's not very common um, it's kind of more used for extreme circumstances for example we've seen it or i've seen it in situations where the other parent is in jail um, obviously unable to make those kind of decisions or if the other parent is just absent entirely if they've been um, they've essentially abandoned the children for x number of years then it's more likely that you're going to be able to have sole parental responsibility over the kids um, other than sole parental responsibility, the court can choose also shared parental responsibility. Just like it sounds, that means that parents have equal rights when it comes to decision making on the kids. So they have to keep each other informed and they have to make all these decisions together and come to a consensus. The third option that the court has is sole, um, shared parental responsibility for the final decision making authority. In that case, Marcy and Ed would have to keep each other informed and try to come to a consensus when it comes to whatever decision needs to be made for the children. But let's say Marcy and Ed can't come to an agreement. If the court would have already declared Marcy as the parent that had final decision making authority, Marcy gets the final say in that situation. Uh, then we have time sharing. Time sharing is essentially what has replaced visitation. So when it comes to time sharing, the court's gonna assign one parent as the majority time sharing parent. 
Obviously, that means the parent that has the children the majority of the time, that has most of the overnights throughout the year. And then the opposite parent would become the minority time sharing parent. Um, as far as custody goes, it's really more of a term that's now reserved for like um, school designation purposes. You can choose one parent to be the custodial parent, but it's not, it's more of an updated term these days. Um, the other topic when it comes to children is child support. So for child support, um, a lot of times people think that it's some random number that gets assigned, and that's not the case actually. We have here in Florida what's called the Child Support Guidelines Worksheet. Um, you can actually look it up yourself to see how it looks. It's a lot similar to, let's say, an Excel spreadsheet, and there's several factors that um, need to be addressed when determining what makes up that number that you're going to have to pay. So a couple of those things is obviously the parent's income, right? And the way that the court knows the income of the parents is because both of the spouses are gonna to have to turn in a document that's called a financial affidavit right at the beginning of your case. Um, as your case continues to progress, you need to keep having that financial affidavit updated. So what is your income? Another factor could be the number of overnights that each parent has with the children. So obviously the parent that's gonna have the children most of the time throughout the year, is more likely not going to be the parent that's going to be paying child support, right? It's going to be the opposite parent. Um, also, there's other ways that the parent contributed to the children. For example, if they have them on their medical, the medical benefits, um, or if they're contributing to them by paying for daycare, that's something that's also going to be taken into account on the child support guidelines worksheet. Um, just to briefly mention, also we have obviously a lot of couples who um, are elderly couples who have adult children. The court does not have jurisdiction to decide what happens to adult children. Obviously, there's not going to be any time sharing issues with adult children. We do have some situations, though, where people that are trying to get a divorce and have adult children have agreed that they want to split the cost of college expenses for their kids. In a situation like that, again, the court doesn't have jurisdiction, but if you want to come to an agreement with, for that with your spouse, you can um, include that in your marital settlement agreement, and then that would be enforceable through contract law. So now we're going to go over grandparents' visitation rights. Now, again, obviously, this doesn't have to do with dissolution of marriage, but this is a topic that is discussed a lot with um, our elderly clients that are interested in family law cases. So I'm going to talk about that. There are uh, several mechanisms that would enable a grandparent to have visitation or custody of a grandchild I'm not going to talk about guardianship. What I'm going to talk about is uh, the visitation rights statute, uh, as well as temporary custody by an extended family member. So it's possible for a grandparent to petition the court for visitation with their grandchild if both of the parents are deceased, missing, or in a vegetative state. Or alternatively, if one of the parents is deceased, missing, or in a vegetative state, and the other parent is considered a substantial threat to the child's health or welfare due to having a, a felony for that kind of, uh, of an offense. So something perhaps like child abuse or a sex crime uh, against the child. So the the grandparent could petition for time uh, to spend with the child. And always when the court addresses situations with children, they are also going to look at what's in the best interest of the child and they make an ultimate determination about that. The other kind of uh, case that a grandparent could file would be temporary custody of a child by an extended family member. That particular law requires that there be a particular family relationship between the child and the person that is petitioning the court for temporary custody. The individual would need to have the child in their custody if they didn't have the parent's consent initially. And if they didn't have the parent's consent to temporary custody, then they would need to petition the court and show that the parents had abused, abandoned, or neglected the child. Those are basically the, the sort of things that are typically handled by the 
dependency court to the court that you end up in when the Department of Children and Families is called out. So similar to a dependency case, the grandparent would need to petition the court if, if they don't have the parent's consent and they would need to prove up abuse, abandonment, or neglect. And the reason that a grandparent would want to do such a thing is that the order would enable them to do things like enroll the child in school, make medical decisions for the child, um, get records for the child, that sort of thing. Now, sometimes the orders do permit for the parents to have uh, time sharing, you know, some visits with the children, and in some cases, the orders will also order child support so that the grandparent would receive some sort of support from the parents. All right, so let's go to high point number five. Marcy's daughter, Tanya, has a drug problem. The state is threatening to take the children from her. Tanya wants Marcy to take the grandchildren in, to take her children, grandchildren in while she goes to rehab and tries to work it out with her husband, Chuck. So what issues do we see here? Well, so this would be the kind of case that would be appropriate for temporary custody by an extended family member. She, she Marcy may be able to get consent from uh, both Tanya and Chuck. Now, if she doesn't get consent from them, and uh, she doesn't have Tanya's daughter living with her, and then she's gonna have to go to the court and show to the court how Tanya has abused, abandoned, or neglected the child. So perhaps Tanya's drug problem has resulted in a scenario where the grandchild has been left alone, has, hasn't had adequate care, hasn't had adequate food, um, you know, something of that nature. Now, if Chuck, it's wind of the case, and you know she and Marcy's petitioned the court, and he's, he would have to be served, um, and he hasn't given Marcy consent, and she's unable to prove that Chuck has done anything abusive to the child, and the court's not going to award Marcy um, temporary custody. So this is. Uh, Generally, our last topic is annulment. Um, I'm going to briefly touch it because it really, there's, there's actually no statute under Florida law that allows for annulment. But the court can grant annulment if he finds that the marriage was never valid to begin with. And what are examples on void marriages from the onset? Uh, something like bigamy or incest. That would be those would be examples of actually cases that. They can be annulled because the, board, the, the, the marriage was actually not valid to begin with. Um, there's other parts of annulment. Uh, for example, if the uh, marriage was obtained by fraud, duress, or temporary insanity, those are other reasons. Arguably, those are probably more difficult ways to prove the case. Um, but, but still, if you have the basis and you have the evidence, those are other means to annul the case. Now, generally speaking, when you have a void marriage, does the innocent spouse would not necessarily receive any of the benefits uh, as if you would in a divorce, but case law recently actually has established that um, when there's an innocent spouse and they didn't know about the, the bigamy or the incest or whatever but from a prior marriage of the spouse, they can be awarded uh, alimony and division of property so long as it's proven that they were the innocent spouse. Again, this is not codified. There is no statute, but there is case law that supports it, and that's how we we go through uh, that analysis. So our last typo. Um, okay, we go. So we have a typo that talks about this topic as well. Once she gets to Florida, Marcy takes a 23andMe DNA test and finds out that Ed has children she did not know about. Agnes is more tech savvy than Marcy, so she shows Marcy how to look at social media. The pair looks up Ed's two children with lots of time on their hands and Agnes is inter internet savvy. Uh, they learned that Ed was married before he married Marcy and that he never got a divorce. So how does this apply? So yeah, Marcy would be able to essentially try to get an annulment. And depending on, and of course, from prior records, we learned that she'd be married to Ed for 30 years. So there is a good likelihood that uh, Marcy can say, listen, I didn't know 
that uh, Ed was married. I just found out recently doing this research and I just stumbled across this and, you know, I didn't know. And, you know, she can essentially request alimony and division of marital assets, uh, the division of property uh, and, and try to get something out of this, uh, despite the fact that the marriage is void from the onset. So we had a couple of other random topics that we didn't really have a place for. I've already discussed pets. Um, so we have a retirement funds, um, social security benefits. Um, I think you, um, oh. And yeah, thank you. I was just gonna give, we have about 10 minutes left. We're at 4.48. Okay. okay, well, we can go straight to questions now, if that's okay. Well, one, one thing I do want to mention about a state money that, that I forgot to mention when I was talking about equitable distribution, and it's, it's just a statement, but um, when, you're not, when you're looking at the state planning, if the parties, if two spouses actually broke wills um, and they left uh, property in the wills, in their respective wills, the divorce will sever that uh, the, the acquisition of anything through the other, from, from the other spouse's will by the mere fact that they're divorcing. So even if the spouse that has the will dies and forgets to actually um, update the will before death, if the divorce has already occurred, the divorce by operation of law, the, the, that, that spouse that um, no longer receives anything through the will, even though that the, the, the spouse that died did not change that will. I don't know if that, if that made that too confusing. So, no, so, okay, so, correct me. Um, essentially, the ex-spouse would no longer get anything regarding the fact that the will still referred to them as the spouse because the divorce was already granted. Correct. So, so it voids so, the will. Right, so, we, we so have, it says, to my wife, then it would void. Well, to, to my wife, you know, that, that you know, if it was if, if it had been Marcy at the time, then yes, it would void that provision because there's there's a divorce, so they no longer inherit. Even if he forgot to update the will and kind of take away after the divorce, you know, and to take out the wife uh, portion of it. Okay. So um, at this time, we are open to any questions. If you have any. Um, um, well. Thank you so much, all three of you. Uh, I really like the way that you put this together with hypos and really giving it um, sort of a tangible fact uh, um, a pattern. That way we could actually follow the legal issues and the analysis. So thank you very much for all the thought and what you put into this presentation. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat or in the Q&A, um, but we will you know, remind folks we're on for about another 10 minutes. We can always end early as well. But if anyone does have any questions, please take this time to put them through. Um, and in the meantime, you know, I was thinking, I imagine sort of that last topic that you sort of were talking about, you know, with wills and how that plays in with, you know, it made me think, what is the most common type of, you know, issue you experience with the elder population when coming into, you know, dissolutions of marriage? Um, is that it, or is there a big, a big focus of the work that we do is domestic violence work. And in my experience, the biggest issue is that in my case is that a, a wife has been a homemaker um, and they haven't adequately prepared financially for life if they become divorced. Yeah. Or even in some cases where people may marry in middle age and they think that their spouse is going to take care of them until they die and then something erupts uh, in the marriage, you know, and, and maybe they've been married 15 years or so and the wife, again, does not have the resources to live on her own and her spouse doesn't have the financial ability to support her um, and so as long as it's a, it's a big crisis, um, you know, just things that the person needs to survive in terms of um, getting supplement, supplemental uh, health insurance policies, um, you know, transportation, a home, just basic necessities, where the person's gonna go uh, when they separate from their spouse, uh, that sort of thing. 
You know, I have a lot of um, clients, it's a huge source of anxiety when they learn that their retirement benefits could essentially be split, at least the majority of them, if it was a really long marriage after the divorce, that's not really common knowledge. Um, and I do want to make sure that um, everyone that's watching today also knows that just, we kind of gave you the uh, the law, right? So what the judge can do if you guys don't come to an agreement on certain things, but there is, at least in Florida, at least in uh, the counties that we work in, mediation is mandatory. So if you go to mediation and come, can come to some sort of agreement with your spouse, um, for example, on retirement benefits, you know what, I don't care what the law says, um, you keep your retirement benefits, I'll keep mine. The law, the court isn't going to um, negate that. They're not, yeah, they're not going to interfere. They're going to rubber stamp, you know, for the most part, whatever agreement you guys come up with. Um, the only thing that I've seen as far as something that they would not do is if there was minor children, you can't waive child support. Um, that's something that's not possible. But hopefully, um, you know, this is just kind of a backdrop plan B if you guys do not come to an agreement in your divorce. Hopefully, it's a lot more amicable than what we've described here today. And another question I had, um, you know, is because you all are really in the trenches and you all are, um, you know, litigating these types of cases on a regular basis. Uh, are there any um, pieces of advice that you can provide for attorneys maybe new to uh, dealing with uh, the elder, elderly population as a client? versus, um, you know, anyone else uh, in the context of divorce, you know, is there any sort of practice tip or advice on how to best, um, you know, represent that client? Mm -hmm. um, well, so in the examples that I gave where the person isn't financially prepared, it's important to look at, you know, whether there are any sort of support services, would it be possible for the person to get on a waiting list maybe for elderly housing? Um, you know, are there alternate sources of health insurance that the person could obtain? There have been individuals who didn't want to divorce right away because they wanted to wait um, as it relates to, uh, to Social Security to be married for 10 years so that the, their benefit draws off of their spouses um, instead of their own work history, that sort of thing. So having resources available is really helpful. Yeah, I would also just say um, use your networking, right? So it's like talk to other attorneys that do have a lot more experience in their own law. And um, there's no shame in doing that, right? That's how we, we that's how I learn a lot of things in every single subject that I that I practice for. Um, I know that there's also plenty of time where I've looked into the Social Security website myself. There's a lot of really good information there on how to handle certain issues when it comes to divorce. Um, yeah. So, and the, the same thing for um, military retirement mm -hmm. and um, federal benefits, um, you know, thrift savings accounts, that sort of thing. I've found a lot of information online, even information about how to go ahead and get an appropriate court order to divide those, um, those benefits. Yeah, that's a great reminder, a great reminder of those resources um, that we may often just think don't, you know, aren't out there for us. So thank you for that. Um, I know we, we have about four minutes left. Um, so I... What? One other thing to mention um, just is that there is a filing fee for filing for divorce and there is the application for the termination of civil indigent status. And if an individual qualifies, then their filing fee is waived, the service uh, process fee if it's in Florida is typically waived. In some instances, the person doesn't have to pay for mediations. And that's the sort of thing that clerks typically don't advertise. They're not going to let you know, hey, you can get this for free. So you have to uh, ask for it or go to the Florida Courts website. We have the, the website address listed there. Um, so a person is going to want to get um, that form. And, and I've had people tell me that they went in and asked for a fee waiver and the clerk said they didn't know what they were talking about. So you have to ask for it by name, application for determination of civil indigent status, or obtain one from the Florida Courts website. 